Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to those that have joined us for any of the earlier sessions. Um, if, you're, if today is the first one that you are joining us for, we're really glad that you were able to come here with us today. If you dis, did miss one of the earlier sessions, uh, we have videoed the content and we will make that available when that is prepared by the videographer. Uh, as you know, today is our final webinar on Vibrios and it is being brought to you by the team here at Safe Fish. Again, apologies for those that do know me, but for the ones that don't, my name is Natalie Dowsett and I'm the uh, Executive Officer of Safe Fish. This is a program that supports safety and market access for the Australian seafood industry. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, our program manager, Alison Turnbull. You'll hear from her shortly. Uh, she will introduce the speakers and the content that we'll be covering today. Uh, before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, I, on behalf of the participants here today and Safe Fish, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Thank you all for joining us again. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to Alison now, who will introduce what we're talking about today. Thank you, Nat. First, an introduction to Safe Fish. This is the program that's made this webinar series possible today. So we are a long-standing program that has successfully supported seafood safety and market access for the Australian seafood industry for over a decade now. We're funded by a wide range of industry stakeholders and the Australian government through the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Our program is overseen by a partnership of regulators, uh, other government authorities, seafood industry and research organisations. And this is the key to our strength and our success in the past. So we focus on high priority issues for Australian seafood working on the knowledge that an outbreak or an illness in any of these seafoods will have flow on impacts on all species. Vibriosis associated with bivalves is one of the issues that we're currently working on. And this is basically based mainly on the increased illnesses that we've had associated with Vibrios so far uh, in recent times. So here is our high level summary of Vibrio parahemolyticus illnesses that have occurred in states that have Fibrio parahemolyticus as a notifiable disease from 2012 until early 2019. And you'll notice that all of those states have reported illness, generally associated with oysters. Um, and importantly, the source of those oysters has come from all of our major shellfish producing states, New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania as well as potentially from WA. So this is an issue affecting all states and it's an issue that is currently continuing. So um, to my knowledge, we've had at least another 10 cases since March, 2019. So that is why we're running this Vibrio, Vibrio series um, at the moment. Last week, we had two um, very informative sessions. Firstly, Dorothy Jean McCubrey introduced us to Vibrios and the science of Vibrios. And then in the second webinar, we had a discussion around what we can practically do to reduce risk of vibriosis. And we got some great perspectives then from Dan Roden, an industry member, and Owen Hunt, a regulator, around the first outbreak that happened in Tasmania in 2016 and how they adapted post that. Today, we'll be discussing whether guidance needs to be introduced in Australia. And if so, what that guidance could or should look like and include. We have no set agenda here, so we have a free-ranging discussion and we're interested to hear from all of our stakeholders. Dorothy Jean will start us off again. So for those who are new this week, Dorothy Jean McCubre is a Shellfish um, International Consultant in Shellfish Quality Assurance from New Zealand, and she's worked with Australia frequently in the past. DJ has also worked with the FAO and the US FDO and FDA and completed her PhD in um, food safety science and governance using vibriosis amongst seafood consumers as an exploratory lens. So following DJ, we will hear from um, Bill Dewey from Taylor's Shellfish in Washington State, USA. Bill works on environmental, health, human health, aquaculture and regulatory policy issues as the Director of Public Affairs of Taylor's Shellfish. He works at the local, state and federal levels. So Bill also runs his own shellfish farm and has done for 25 years. He also participates in the Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Conference um, and has done for over 30 years there 
This is a very large conference in the USA which sets sanitation controls for shellfish in the US. I'd like to say that the ISSC is a little bit like ASQAC or the Australian Shellfish Quality Assurance Advisory Committee on Steroids, but even that falls short of the difference in size between ASQAC and the ISSC. So suffice to say, Bill is incredibly experienced in both farming and policy development, and we're very lucky to have him here today. We're also lucky to have Enrico Buenaventura, um, especially given that it's after dinner time in Canada. So we appreciate you logging on so late, Enrico. Enrico started life as a microbiologist and is currently the Chief Scientific Advisor to Health Canada. Previous roles, he was the head of the risk assessment team for Health Canada, Canada and prior to that, head of the risk assessment team in the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Enrico was highly involved in the development of Vibrio guidance in Canada, and that's what we're going to hear from him about today. I first met Enrico at the International Conference of Molluscan Shellfish Safety, where he looms large due to his knowledge across a wide range of contaminants in shellfish. Um, he has, his knowledge is incredibly impressive. He has a very heavy travel schedule and a, and a wide ranging network. And because of this, I think that his situational awareness globally of shellfish risks is probably um, unparalleled elsewhere. So without any more to do, over to you, Dorothy. Right, thank you very much, Ali, for that introduction. Now I'm not going to go over all that we talked about in the last two sessions but sufficient to say that by now you will appreciate Vibrio parahemolyticus is a wicked problem. It, it's an environmental problem with knowledge gaps, food safety risks um, along, the, uh, along the food chain. And you'll say, well, I can give VP a better and worse name than a wicked problem, but indeed environmental science actually defines a wicked problem as something that's embedded in a complicated system, which Vibrios are, they're both in the marine world and they affect us on land. The problem can be defined multiple ways, no matter whether it's a human illness problem, a market access problem, or um, a climate change problem. And there are human cause, human values at the core, for example, food safety and what people perceive as their food safety right. Other wicked problems that um, are defined around the world include climate change, etc. So you can see that VP is a problem that is complicated. It's no wonder that we haven't quickly solved it. Right. Well, I started out this series pointing out that um, our four bear shellfish sanitation um, relatives had achieved a lot. They successfully solved the problems around Vibrio cholera and typhoid and they did that by using a combination of good science and public policy. And we stand on their shoulders because we really use the systems that they established for us. Our shellfish sanitation um, programs have solved so many of our problems. Um, and if we continue to learn from our forebears. Um, now, science, science by itself doesn't actually solve a problem, even if we, when it comes to Vibria, we don't have all the answers and we've, we've discussed that earlier. But even if we did have all the answers for VP, which would not solve the problem because science alone cannot solve our public health issues. Science always needs a, a social action to make it work. For example, Scientists told us that cigarette smoking will cause lung cancer. And we can tell people as much as we like, but unless they choose to give up smoking, there's not going to be any difference. Louis Pasteur, he um, identified pasteurization as a really good food safety technology. But it wasn't really until the public health um, officials decided that the burden associated with unpasteurized milk was so, so significant that there should be some mandatory changes and they brought in pasteurization of the milk supply. So you can see science can put up factors, but it depends on society's decisions whether they wish to involve themselves with that particular action. 
always in life when we have society not everybody wants to do the same thing so we have a variety of ways of making sure that social action happens we can educate people and allow them to make their own informed decision as to how they want to do run their lives um, we can give people guidelines industries themselves might decide that they want to um, lead the way and set up their own codes of practice so that they can advertise their particular brand or formula, et cetera. And then we come through to the more regulatory punishment scenarios. So at each, everything in our lives, somewhere along the way, there's likely been a public policy decision to say, is this important enough? Should we mandate vaccinations for COVID or do we give people the choice, et cetera? And that's an ongoing, um, discussion. Again, in my last two sessions, I've stressed that although Vibrio is a global problem, it's not exactly the same problem everywhere. Even within countries, you will find that there are differences in the physical geography. The industry's practices might differ, particularly if um, some industry people are farming shellfish, whereas others are dredging them from the wild. You'll have different dietary customs and generally different perceptions about what is a safe food and what should people be allowed to eat. So this is perfectly normal. And in a country the size of Australia or the United States or Canada, of course, bigger means more diverse problems because of the physical geography, etc. I threw this map up from the very beginning, saying that I had a cardboard box full of um, references of where there had been VP outbreaks around the world and that my my box probably wasn't big enough there was probably more coloring in to do um, but again that doesn't mean that the whole world has decided the same thing I can take you for a quick stroll around the world to tell you what I mean um, before we do that I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Codex Alimentarius? For those of you who have not, let me introduce Codex. When the world started to have a really highly globalized food supply, it began to travel around the world much more regularly and frequently, the World Trade Organization became involved to make sure that everybody was treated fairly. And of course, one of the things that came up was OK, if I buy food from Africa, will the food safety standards be the same as here in New Zealand, etc.? And so the World Trade Authority decided it was good to set up Codex Alimentarius who can look at all the science and determine regulations that everybody would need to abide by. And then people would have confidence that food safety and science was used similarly around the world and that would aid the quick flow of food around the world. Well, Codex Alimentarius has, has set up many different standards for many foods, and most countries in the world are a signatory of the Codex Alimentarius Commission. So what did Codex do when they looked at Vibrio? Well, they have put out some really good um, science guidelines telling you much the same information as I provided in session one. But then they got to the detail, and the devil is always in the detail. And Codex decided this was such a complicated organism that rather than write one prescriptive set of regulations, they, it was better for countries to determine their own standards based on their own needs. So therefore, there is no universal food regulation for VP at this point in time because we don't have sufficient information. However, let's take a quick stroll around some of the other countries that we've talked about during our time together. The European Union, large significant area of the world and has a the European Union auditors and the European Food Safety Authority has um, a large voice in how they manage things. Well, they set together a science team and they looked at all the information around VP 
and the number of cases that occur in the European Union. And they decided the problem wasn't big enough to be concerned about. So they don't have any standards in the European Union. Even though there are sprinklings of cases and more becoming associated with the Baltic Sea, at the moment there are no VP regulations there. Japan. Um, I bring up Japan because um, it, it's an example of a country that does have a V or did have a VP problem, but it wasn't associated with oysters or shellfish. Interestingly, Japan was the first country to identify VP as a problem in the 1950s, and their major problem food source was actually raw fish. So the Japanese um, health department a few years ago did put in place some regulations and their regulations are around the fact that any fish kept in wet wells, the seawater must be treated to remove VP from the um, water feeding the wet wells. And they also set themselves a standard for of the, num the maximum number of vibrios that could be in the food product at the retail outlet and they also put some management techniques at the retail outlet. Um, their people are supposed to be supplied with ice when they buy their fish, etc. And it has been an extremely successful program. They've reduced their VP issues a lot. But again, it was not related. Their problem did not relate to shellfish. So slightly different to what our forum is about. Um, New Zealand. Well, New Zealand is a signatory to the US um, National Shellfish Sanitation Program. Uh, we did that in the 1980s. We became signatory because we wanted to access the United States market. Um, and so that's um, we, we follow their rules. Um, which leads me on to the NSSP rules. Ali introduced the um, United States to us and the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. This is a long-term program, and um, the, the it's for the program actually is for products being sold interstate. Some states have chosen the, these regulations as their own, but this was really established. The system was really established early on when they found that. Um, the railways came along and suddenly they could take oysters from the coastline through to Chicago quite quickly by rail. And the rich people who could afford oysters were finding themselves becoming sick with typhoid, etc. As a result, the shellfish sanitation in the USA evolved. And nowadays, it is a... Um, a set of standards or regulations which you can easily find online and these rules are debated every two years at a conference um, and that's how the NSSP manual evolves year by year. I've attended many of these conferences since the 1990s and when I first started visiting, Vibrio vulnificus was the major problem um, related to the Vibrio species. And then as the years have gone by, Bill will help us, Bill Dewey will help us with this, they have noticed that VP has actually started to increase in the Atlantic and Pacific states in colder areas than the Gulf of Mexico. And so the Vibrio rules have expanded to now cover Vibrio vulnificus and VP. There, like any policy, there's always debate as to how to set the rules and where the triggers should be at. And I've watched these debates over many years and always when you get there, the, the audience can be divided into two camps. The first camp says, we should do everything possible to prevent illnesses. Industry must have confidence in their product. We must do something. And then you get the naysayers on the other side saying, oh, for heaven's sake, it's only diarrhea. It doesn't kill you. We don't stop people 
boating or swimming, but they can easily pick up BP when they're doing those activities. And so there is this constant debate. But at the moment, and it looks like it's settled in well now, the current NSSP allows a certain burden of Vibrio parahemolyticus illness. And once a state has exceeded that illness burden, they must do something. And the something that is required is if you have a chronic problem or an annual problem related to VP, then you must have a plan. And the plan kind of sets out what you will do when the illnesses start to come, who will close the areas, what structures you may allow around harvesting, like will you still allow harvesting, but it must be done before 10 in the morning, etc. So in other words, the states that have a VP plan adapt it to fit their illness situation. And I know Owen last week um, talked about the fact when they suddenly had VP illnesses in Tasmania, they looked to the United States to help them work out what to do in a VP plan. Um, the other thing that the United States has is in their food code, they require warnings be placed in restaurants and on menus to say to remind people that raw protein, including raw shellfish, has the ability to make people ill and that they should ponder whether they would want to eat raw product and if they are immune, comprom immune compromised, pregnant, etc., then they should definitely ponder their, um, their menu that night. Now, the US is um, quite different in some ways to other countries in the fact that health care is not a given. It's not a human right over there. Um, if you've got employment and access to public health insurance, that's great, but not everybody has medical insurance. And it is the land of litigation. If you become sick, it's frequently the case that the lawyers are the people who win the most because they take large scale court cases against people who may have caused the, the person to have become ill, right back to the farming operation. But um, we can talk more about that later on. I just wanted to explain um, why the US is slightly different. Um, we will come to our Enrico later on, and I will tell you why I chose Enrico. But first of all, I thought I have known Bill Dewey for a number of years, and I have been to Washington State and seen how tailors have managed this problem, which has morphed and grown and not really um, was nothing to do with their poor quality farming. It was a natural event that they had to take ownership of. And so I thought Bill would be just the person to tell us more about the actual problems in the US. Bill. Great, thanks DJ. So yeah, I'm happy to speak on our experience here on the West Coast, uh, probably more so from a Washington state perspective because that's where the majority of my experience is and Taylor's experience is, but we also have farms in British Columbia as well. So uh, I'm familiar with the regulations up there as well. And Rico, I'm sure we'll talk more about those. So, so you've heard uh, about the US program here uh, and the Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Conference. So we have our, our national shellfish sanitation program that produces the guide for the control of mollusk and shellfish. Those are our national regulations and, and tries to bring uniformity between all of the states in their shellfish regulations. It's those regulations uh, are managed and amended by the Interstate Shellfish Annotation Conference that you've heard about from Allie and DJ. And then it's implemented in each state by the state shellfish control authority. So in Washington state, that's our Department of Health. And then the whole program is overseen by the Food and Drug Administration that also audits the states to make sure their regulations are consistent with the national program and that they're administering them appropriately. So it's, it's really uh, done a nice job at providing uniformity across the country and equivalency across the country in our regulations. 
then and the one exception to that interestingly has been with Vibrio because it is so different and, and uh, different in every state that the program it's the one area where the program has allowed states to individualize their regulations with a certain uh, you know basic things that need to be part of those Vibrio control plans uh, a minimal set of things that they need to take into account, but it's allowed the states to customize their plans, which is somewhat unique uh, within the ISSC. So for us in Washington state, Vibrio perihemolyticus came on the radar with outbreaks in, in 1997 and 2006. And, and of course, during this whole time, particularly after that 97 outbreak, uh, the ISSC was debating it between Vibrio vulnificus and Perihem it really is those two bacteria have dominated uh, the conversation at ISSC for years amongst other issues. But vulnificus is a bit different in that it uh, in, mainly impacts people that are immunocompromised where Perihem is what they refer to as ordinarily injurious. It, it essentially everybody's vulnerable to it. So, uh, more challenging perhaps to regulate. The illnesses are of course associated with warm weather and water temperatures uh, and in particular pathogenic strains. Uh, it makes it unlike biotoxins, uh, you know, we haven't been able to crack the nut, so to speak, of being able to go out there and monitor for Vibrios in the environment and set levels that you then shut the industry down, uh, close growing areas based on. It's been particularly challenging. So in 2007 was when our first Vibrio control plan was established in Washington state rules. And then those were updated in 2015 based on knowledge we've gained since 2007 and also uh, changes to the national regulations. So uh, that rule has evolved. So initially it established harvest and transportation requirements for oysters that were being intended for raw consumption. Again, I think in Australia, most of you, as I understand it, most of your oysters are all consumed raw. In Washington state, we actually have a pretty large portion of our industry that shucks, processes their oyster, shucks the meats out and containerizes them. And the vast majority of those are cooked and the review issue is addressed. Uh, so we, we don't have the restrictions for product going for shuck meat, but for raw consumption is where the regulations kick in. And those, those regulations involve stricter time to temperature requirements and closures that were triggered by the number of illnesses from a growing area. So in 2015, uh, when the, the rules were updated, what they did instead was use illness data from the past three years to establish risk levels for each of the growing areas in the state. And then they established stricter time to temperature requirements uh, for areas that had you know, a higher risk and shown more illness history. And so the goal there, of course, was to strive to preemptively prevent illnesses instead of reacting to illnesses and closing areas down uh, based on their illnesses. And I will say, you know, as the public affairs guy for Taylor's and the one who's typically speaking, speaking to the media, uh, it's a much better explanation than telling people, well, we wait until so many people get sick and then we close the growing area down. And that doesn't play so well in the, in the press. So. This gets us out ahead, theoretically gets us out ahead of those illnesses and shuts those areas down when the conditions are such that we, we will anticipate them. And it also importantly incorporated production reporting. And this was all as a result of a change we actually advocated for at the, in the national regulations to incorporate production reporting so that you're actually assessing risk for serving which is really the only way to know if your regulations are being effective because the industry maintained that, you know, our illnesses were staying, this is, was particularly a case with Vulnificus, where the illness level was staying relatively static or maybe even going down, but production was going up. So you were actually being effective with your controls is what the industry asserted, but unless you actually reported that production and you know, calculated a risk for serving, you don't know that. So that's an important part to, consider if you're establishing regulations. So shifting gears and talking a little bit about how it's impacted our industry with these new controls that have gone into place. 
So these harvest restrictions uh, based on water and air temperature are, are what's incorporated in the regulations today. So we have to achieve a 50 degree internal temperature uh, in a certain amount of time. So that's resulted in a lot of record keeping to be able to demonstrate that as well as operational challenges for the industry. Uh, we've built modified harvest containers to ensure that our animals are purged uh, adequately before they come out of the water instead of just big bulk containers with huge, huge weight on top of each other as the oysters are piled into containers. I'll show some pictures of that in a second. And then adding refrigeration to our processing facilities, purchases of refrigerated trucks, ice machines, insulated totes, et cetera, has been a huge capital investment for companies that want to stay in the in the business of selling raw oysters during the summer months to warm weather. A number of growers have just opted out of summer harvest uh, due to the, the rule changes and the challenges of implementing it and the, and the capital expenses of uh, investing in all of that equipment. A number of companies have been involved in, in research uh, to find ways to reduce vibrio load uh, prior to and post harvest. I'll talk more about this chilled wet storage, which is an area tailors are, are getting into in a fairly big way right now. And we're still challenged despite the rule, quite frankly, and all the updates and, and looking at the science and doing the best we possibly can, we are still challenged by sporadic vibrio illnesses, despite even when you know, our company uh, goes above and beyond the requirements and still are challenged uh, with those sporadic illnesses as our other companies. And part of that, you know, for us, is just the volume of oysters that we, we produce as a company. You know, we're, we're generating somewhere around 45 to 50 million oysters a year. So we're out there on a lot of plates uh, and are going to be implicated because of that. So, uh, uh, something that's somewhat unique here, I don't know that this is necessarily the case in Australia. I think your tides are not quite as extreme as they are here, but our, our tides, you know, we're, we're typically probably between a, a um, three and a three and a seven meter uh, tidal exchange. So our oyster beds are exposed to, at low tide uh, during the summer to hot, hot temperatures. And of course, the Vibrio bacteria, as you not, no doubt have learned, uh, from your prior days in the webinar here, this Vibrio bacteria rapidly multiplies and that oyster is like the perfect incubator sitting there on the beach. So, so what we've learned is the Vibrio bacteria purge quickly when the tide returns. Uh, the oysters open up and start filtering and dump that bacteria load pretty quickly. So the regulations require that the oysters be resubmerged for a minimum of four hours. So uh, after the tide returns. So we can't, can no longer do low tide harvest and bring the oysters in off the beach during the summer months. So uh, they have to sit and then be retrieved at high tide following. So instead of going into bags, like you see on the left, we go into baskets uh, with a, a low volume of oysters in the baskets in these frames and these frames have ropes and buoys on them. So when the tide comes back, we can retrieve them and, and after they've had a chance to purge. The boats uh, grab those ropes and buoys, bring the oysters on board, and then we have totes full of ice on the deck of the boats so we can ice the oysters down immediately upon getting them out of the water. Uh, alternatively, uh, in the United States, there, there are four post-harvest processes that you can use to eliminate the Vibrio. Uh, those are the four listed there, cool pasteurization, high hydrostatic pressure, freezing and irradiation. And this is an older slide, I apologize, because that has been approved for a number of years now, the irradiation. But they all uh, result in a dead or nearly dead oyster and change the organoleptic characteristics. So they're not, they haven't been broadly adopted uh, by the industry. I would guess freezing is maybe uh, one of the more common that is used, uh, but the, <clears throat> What tailors have been doing, uh, both with our uh, doing research on this in our Canadian operations, they have a different approach up there where growers just have to get down to a total vibrio load of lower than 100 MPN 
to be able to sell their oysters. And, and so it's allowed innovation in the industry and what growers will do up there. And what we were doing is uh, having our oysters containerized in trays and lowering them down in the water below the thermocline into water that was 15 degrees uh, C and then leaving them there for several days and that would purge the Vibrio. And, and realizing how effective that was, we started playing around with it with refrigerated live holding systems that we had at our facilities in, in Washington state and found that we could do it very effectively there. So we bit the bullet and, and, and spent $5 million and built a, a big refrigerated live holding holding system. There's a picture of it. It's been operational since last summer. And we're just in the process now of working with or some scientists at Oregon State University to do some research on it and hopefully get it validated by the Food and Drug Administration for reducing Vibrio's. So excited about that, but it's just a big closed recirculating recirculating refrigerated seawater system that in those totes, there's eight, eight uh, trays full of oysters in each of the totes. And the refrigeration system on the, on the building there. So the benefits of this is obviously the primary one that we we're shooting for the reduced vibrio levels and illness risk associated with our product. As I mentioned, you know, because of the volume of oysters that we sell, we're on a lot of plates. And of course, one of the most popular ways to eat raw oysters is in a medley plate where you've got an assortment of oysters. And, and it's not uncommon that tailors are gonna be at least one of the oysters on that medley plate. So if there's an illness, we're gonna be implicated. And so we really are anxious to eliminate that risk uh, associated with our oysters. So also gives us the potential to be able to harvest from areas that are closed due to BP if we've got a validated system that can eliminate it. And, and from a pollution closure standpoint, it also allows us to manage around that. If we see a rain event that's going to close a growing area, we can harvest and hold that inventory in the system instead of uh, losing the opportunity to harvest it. It gives us it's just an increased product quality and, and safety confidence with the, with the product as well as dramatically smoothed out our inventory, being able to have that inventory right on hand at the processing facilities. We're able to capture late sales where in the past, if we had to run to the bay to get product, we would miss those sales. It's improved our delivery efficiency and also improved our worker schedules. So lots of, lots of benefits from this system. The Vibrio rules have presented some challenges for transportation. And be, I mentioned we have a big processing industry that shucks oysters for the meat. Uh, a lot of those oysters would be hauled in open dump trucks, which is pretty hard to do when you need to temperature control those oysters now. So companies have had to transition to different containerized oysters and refrigerated trucks to be able to haul those oysters. <clears throat> and that's, you know, transporting refrigerated, uh, as you know, is pretty feasible if you're going by truck, not so when you're going by air, it's harder to keep your product cold when you're going by air. The growers associations, both on the East and the West Coast of the United States where VP has become an issue, have collaborated on pre producing educational materials and put a lot of effort into educating our members during the Vibrio season on uh, best practices for handling their shellfish to eliminate the Vibrio illness risk. And we do, a, we feel we do a better job marketing than the State Department of Health does. Uh, our material is a little more uh, friendly than the warning signs that Department of Health is posting on the beaches, but understand the need for these as well. So in summary, <clears throat> as you've no doubt learned from your prior days in the webinar, VP likes that warm water and warm weather. It's resulted here in the United States in harvest restrictions and or post-harvesting, post-harvest processing, which can limit the supply and consumer choices. It definitely has resulted in major operational changes for the industry at significant expense. And for some, it has meant just not operating during the summer months. And, you know, it, it, there's no question the industry has collaborated in, in all of these efforts. We don't want to make people sick with our product. And nobody likes uh, that outcome. So 
lots of cooperation, whether it be through ISSC and the rulemaking or in our states with the rulemaking, but also with the scientists to try to find solutions um, that will get us safe oysters. So that's it. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Bill. I'm so pleased I invited you. You're right, definitely the right man for the job. And besides hearing all your information, I've learned something because last week somebody asked me about artificial depuration of shellfish and I said, no, 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 that won't work. So it just shows the science is moving along all the time and congratulations on taking the big plunge of spending $5 million to explore that option further. Thank you very much, Bill, for your presentation. But I just wanted to give you some background as to why I thought Enrico was just my man for this particular session. Um, as I said before, VP is a problem around the world. But when I looked at, for at a country with similarities to Australia, I decided Canada was a good fit. And that's because it's a large country that has an aquaculture industry on two oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, it sells to the USA, but more than that, it's a Commonwealth country, which means that they think similarly to us down here under. Um, their public health service is very similar in the way it thinks around regulations and standards. And besides that, Enrico is a top bloke who can explain it well. So Enrico, tell us the challenge that you took on. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the food safety system in Canada. As DJ said, uh, we are a federal government as well, uh, based on the British system. Uh, talk a little bit about the outbreak in 2015. Uh, Bill already talked about the 1997, which sets up to the next decades. Uh, talk about the risk management recommendations in Canada uh, as part of the uh, outbreak response. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about Health Canada's guideline. And then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, international risk assessments from FAO, WHO, uh, sum it up with the regulatory and industry responses in Canada. And then uh, mention one or two outbreaks in the end uh, to give you a bit of perspective on what's going on. Um, okay, so in Canada, the food safety system is a shared responsibility between government, industry, and the consumers. Uh, each government uh, can establish and enforce food safety related laws, regulations, standards, and policies, and they can be in the provincial. Uh, federal or territorial, and in some cases, even at the local level. For consumers, they have a role in ensuring good food handling practices, follow cooking instructions, and report violations of food safety issues. So the responsibility is within the whole food, food continuum. At the federal level, uh, there are four departments responsible, the Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is our enforcement agency, as well as Agriculture and Agri-Food uh, Canada. Um, Health Canada is responsible as the mandate for establishing food safety policies and standards, and we do uh, risk assessments. I'm highlighting this because I'm gonna walk you through how we do that with the Brios. Um, I am in the food directorate. We have the Bureau of Nutrition Science. We have the Bureau of Chemical Safety. And for the uh, Bureau of Microbial Hazards, our mission statement is to enhance the microbiological safety of the Canadian food supply. As uh, DJ has mentioned and Ali, I work now at the director's office uh, as a senior scientific advisor. In the Bureau, we have an evaluation division and a research division where our scientists work collaboratively uh, in, in setting standards and doing risk assessments. So um, why are we here? Um, Bill has already indicated that there was a very large outbreak in 1997. And this is in the whole West Coast of uh, North America, really, uh, Canada and the USA. Um, in 1998, the year after, uh, Health Canada provided an interim guideline of 100 MPN. So as early as 1998, Health Canada already has a guideline uh, preliminarily to manage uh, Debrio uh, 
from 1998 to about 2014, we were managing uh, within those guidelines, maintaining our cases to about one per hundred thousand or less. However, in 2015, we had a fairly large outbreak. I'm uh, the one in red is British Columbia. Uh, Canada itself uh, is a very large country, as DJ has indicated, over 202,000 kilometers of coastline. British Columbia in red is about 37,500 kilometers of coastline. So we had 82 lab confirmed illnesses. It's primarily from domestic sources, from raw oysters harvested in the coastal waters of British Columbia. It was a, a significant El Nino year. Uh, average temperature was two degrees above norm. And I have references on the slide if you want to look it up. We published it. So uh, in 2015, we did a very rapid risk assessment where we have um, look at the data set from industry and from the harvest site and where we set on 100 MPN. Um, at, uh, at the point of uh, consumption. In setting that standard, uh, we look at international uh, guidelines that's out there. We look at ICMSF, which is an international uh, group of experts. Uh, this is a very simplified table, but just to show you that uh, their, their guidelines is within 100 or less than 100. We look at Japan and DJ has already indicated that that standard is not substantially on shellfish, but on a lot of their raw fish consumption, but their shellfish is also less than 100. We look at Hong Kong. Uh, at that time, Hong Kong already has a less than 100 CFU uh, guideline. We look at published ones from Australia and New Zealand. It also says less than 100 CFU for ready to eat foods. We looked at Russia, uh, less than 100 CFU. We looked at the United Kingdom, it's less than 20 for RTE foods. And as DJ indicated and Bill, uh, for the US, uh, it has a, a 10,000 limit in the books uh, today. So when we look at the guideline we have implemented and we look at uh, comparability and alignment, uh, our, our guidelines are well within uh, their jurisdictions. Essentially, if you can meet the guidelines in Canada, you can meet the guideline anywhere else in the world. So our guideline, five sam samples, no sample can exceed 100 MPN. We implemented this in British Columbia starting in August, 2015. Uh, this is during the outbreak or, or when the outbreak is just uh, uh, cresting. Um, we did not close areas. We allowed the sale of products as long as you met the criteria. We did not have any illnesses as so related to this uh, controls. And uh, in 2016, we allowed, um, we, we allowed this standard to apply nationally, including uh, imported products. I got this from the BC Center for Disease Control. I wasn't able to update this for this presentation, but I have a link below that you can look up where this data was derived. As you can see, um, there was a fairly large, uh, slowly increasing uh, rate of illnesses uh, approaching 2015. And then the program was implemented. And, and to date, uh, these cases have been uh, less than one per 100,000. Okay, so we had an outbreak in 2015. It's fairly large. It had a very significant impact on our industry and uh, a loss of market share for, for a lot of our um, growers. So we had a, a, a meeting so that we could talk about what happened. And in the meeting, I have uh, put down the reference down there of what the recommendations are. And I'm only gonna talk about the recommendation that was asked from Health Canada. So the challenge with the program in 2015 was the trigger for implementing uh, your uh, harvesters, harvester risk management measures or preventative programs is a single date. On May 1st, you, you started. Um, the group felt that this is not sufficient, that uh, they need additional guidance on other parameters that can be used as part of the uh, management program, the risk management controls during the Vibrio season. So in response to this request, we look at uh, three uh, triggers that could be used. 
for implementation of the harvester process and risk management plan. Uh, a regular trigger, an enhanced one, and an immediate one. So what does it look like? So May 1 was not a sufficient uh, parameter to conduct, uh, to initiate your programs for the start of the, uh, the Biblio season. So we added two more parameters. So the date, the water temperature, anything over uh, when you hit 15 or over 15 centigrade of water or, or oyster meat, or any uh, trend showing levels approaching 100 BPM PM. DJ has already indicated that 15 degrees is not uh, associated with outbreaks. It's a range of temperature, but uh, that came from the expert working group that we don't see very many outbreaks. So we don't see outbreaks at 15. Uh, but we see cases anywhere from 12 degrees to 19 degrees, depending on the situation. So that's when you implement your program. When does the BP season end? Uh, when your uh, water or oyster meat temperatures are consistently less than 15, or your BP levels at point of harvest is consistently less than three, or non-detectable levels. So what would you do to do an enhance? Um, it may be applicable or not applicable. It really depends on the harvesting conditions. Uh, in some cases, this would be subject to industry or active monitoring for the specific parameters uh, that applies to their hazard. Uh, industry in Canada is required to do hazard controls or preventative control programs. Um, so if they're monitoring certain parameters, they may need to enhance their program depending on what those would be. If an applicable parameter is met, for example, temperature, or higher uh, uh, levels, uh, they need to increase their uh, management uh, programs to an enhanced level. So what would those typically be if there's an increasing trend in BP illnesses? Uh, programs in general are intended to reduce sporadic cases. So when you start seeing increase in sporadic cases, it's time to do an enhance uh, of your pro enhancement of your program, changes in environmental conditions. And as indicated, if your routine program of testing is showing levels or trends of increasing levels, then you need to move to a more enhanced program. Um, so for BP illnesses, it's, you're looking at illnesses above expected values. So in British Columbia in particular, the BC Center for Disease Control publishes a weekly illness report that shows the trend analysis. So you can use them as, as guidance for your program. What are the typical changes in environmental conditions? When you have very significant warm weather, like heat waves that are going on, uh, that can result in very high levels in the water column. Uh, when you have transitory incidents, for example, if you're doing intertidal harvest and there's a lot of storm events that causes uh, disturbance of the sediments, I think you should have uh, more enhanced controls of your product. For testing results, uh, again, this is related to product testing for the plant, for the harvester, where you're looking at your trends, any product testing results are resulting in 100 that can be attributed to growing conditions or the presence of certain um, potentially pathogenic strains. I think uh, in the previous two webinars, we're talking about some of the pandemic strains. When that is detected, I think you should do uh, enhanced. Um, so we call this an immediate stringent. Uh, everybody does this differently, but this is when you start getting into those outbreak situations where your product is starting to get linked to epidemiological illnesses, for example, and you need to have more enhanced or more stringent ones. For example, um, uh, triggers for implementation. This is a regular one. You start monitoring your water temperature. You start doing regular testing of your oysters and you implement controls on intertidal harvest. So some processors, as you will see later, uh, they may stop uh, intertidal harvest altogether. Um, an example of where you may have enhanced is when you have a significant um, heat wave. Uh, so in this case, we recommend you rapidly cool your products to less than 10 degrees in less than 20 minutes. 
and maintain it in the cold chain. If applicable, you suspend your intertidal harvest because those conditions are quite favorable for growth of embryo. Um, some processors uh, can implement deep water holds. So if they have suspended cultures, they may drop it as low as uh, five meters uh, lower uh, to get into colder waters, uh, maybe more frequent uh, temperature checks. Uh, more stringent, this is when you start um, getting into those higher than normal illnesses, for example, uh, resubmersion of current production. So if you have an intertidal harvest, you can resubmerge. And I think Bill told you about practices where they will hold them uh, submerged for some period of time, uh, implement uh, more stringent and immediate post-harvest controls of the final product. You can choose to divert to cooking up market, or in, in some cases, you can uh, choose just to uh, stop raw harvest altogether. So, um, the Health Canada guideline. At the Bureau of Microbial Hazard, we follow a framework for doing risk analyses. If you look at the last three bullets down on the far right, uh, at the end of that, we have a risk management decision to make. Do we regulate, do we provide guidance, or do we set a standard? And the way we do that is when we do the risk analysis activity, we, we do some data gathering. And, and it's a very formal way, the way we do it at Health Canada. We do what is known as a call for data. This is the first one we did in 2016. We wanted to identify within the uh, food continuum factors that may impact the increased risk to, to the presence of Vibrio, as well as identify uh, uh, potential mitigation steps uh, specific to the production, distribution, and consumption of this uh, products for raw. Uh, we are looking for production and processing related information uh, micro testing results at any stage, including the restaurant, uh, whether they are for routine monitoring for QA purposes and other exceptional testing data for temperature. Uh, some would have salinity data, some would have turbidity data. And we do this countrywide um, and we uh, put a confidentiality clause so that any propriety information we would not disclose those. So we got respondents from uh, the food continuum, from harvesters to processors, distributors, retailers, as well as restaurants. Um, what we found is that they start to be pre-season using a specific date or a combination of air water temperatures and other abiotic factors uh, applicable to the harvest site. We have harvests, for example, that look at turbidity. That's when the uh, temperature changes and there's a massive zooplankton that starts uh, going up so the turbidity and the water column increases. What that means is the vibrio is also emerging away from the sediments. They overwinter in the sediments, as you, as you heard before, and that's a signal for them that it's starting to come up. So that's when they, they start. Um, they control the oysters at, at harvest. Uh, this is through deep water suspension. So they find the thermocline and they would adjust anywhere from five meters to 15 meters down. Uh, they do deep water holds of cultures, that is prior to harvest, they're gonna sink them for a period of days. Um, they would, uh, in some cases, stop intertidal and move to uh, other uh, resources, uh, or they would stop harvesting altogether. I mean, that, that is the controls we're seeing. In terms of how they rapidly cool, they prefer ice or ice bath. There's very few indicated any form of mechanical refrigeration. The preferred ones appear to be ice and ice bath. Um, the oysters, when they are uh, entering the processing plant, uh, they are temperature controlled. Uh, we also found that there's adequate refrigeration at its distribution, retail and restaurant level. Uh, and um, more often than not, um, monitoring of temperatures being performed, and there's records of these at various stages. So, in order to finalize our guidance, we sent a similar one, a similar call for data in 2019. Uh, that is intended to finalize the data. What we found is we, we had some very similar feedback. So, uh, that's the rationale where in 2020 we have finalized our guideline. So 
briefly on FAO risk assessments. Um, DJ has already indicated a, a number of these. Um, so the, uh, the FAO, WHO Commission on Expert Meeting on the issue of Vibrios, pathogenic Vibrios in seafood, to assessing the impact on recent outbreaks, particularly in northern waters, as DJ has indicated. Uh, there's a growing evidence of expansion of this expand of, of the infections of poleward, South Pole and North Pole, North Pole and South Pole. Um, and there's a need to update the uh, risk assessment uh, that was done initially in 2010. Uh, so an expert panel was convened. Uh, the report uh, is on the link below on this slide. Uh, there were several uh, risk assessments, five all together, that's been done. I provided the link in the slides because uh, they are not easy to find and uh, you can look them up. Uh, the latest two is uh, MRA 22 related to methods and MRA 20, which was just published last year, was an update to the ones that was done in 2010. And as I indicated, in May 2019, an expert meeting was convened in Weymouth to review the current science, data gaps, epidemiology, laboratory methods, um, look at models. Um, that report is in draft. Uh, preliminary findings is in the link that I've indicated below. Uh, the 2010 updates uh, relate to recent epidemiological data, uh, certain approaches in remote sensing based risk assessment models, improvements to detection and molecular methods, certain aspects related to best practices for reducing risk, and information related to climate change as well as demographics. All of which were presented key aspects in terms of modulating human health risk associated with pathogens. The key findings essentially there is an emergence of the highly uh, pathogenic strains such as the O4K12 or sequence type 36, if you're doing whole genome sequencing. There is a poleward spread of Vibrio infections, probably related to climate change. Um, there's a demographic consideration uh, related to aging population, as well as at-risk population. Um, countries like India and China are getting to be very rich. And when you get, a, uh, get to that stage, they tend to drink more, and when you drink more, you get into more uh, liver issues, uh, and therefore more at risk for some types of vibrio. Uh, there's also elements on best practices, which are cost affected. You heard some of this from DJ and Bill uh, today as well. Uh, new methods have been explored related to whole genome sequencing as we get into more and more precise methods, use of satellite imaging, uh, use of models, uh, specifically where these model repositories will, can be held so that people can do them. But the expert group also has found that the data gaps continue to be there uh, related to characterization of the strains and high quality data uh, remains to be a challenge. So um, just to sum up, we had a, uh, working with industry and other regulators in the federal system in Canada. Um, by setting a guideline at 100 MPN for all five subsamples, it's an opportunity for our industry to innovate. We don't particularly care how you get to 100 at point of consumption, as long as you get there. Uh, industry has innovated where they will do deep water holes, where they will put them in cooler water temperatures. In some cases, some of the processors will actually pump the water from cooler waters up to their resource. So however you get there, as long as you meet the criteria, um, that's all we care about. Uh, the testing is a requirement until you have a validated process. But the goal is to allow industry to innovate so that they can have processes and practices in place that will achieve that criteria without testing. Uh, we're still hopeful that some uh, would be able to submit those processes, but until then they are required. Uh, to do the testing. Um, um, our illnesses are down uh, below one per 100,000. Uh, we have very few recalls, probably one or two in the last five years, and we do not close our harvest sites. Um, I wanted to mention two more ones, uh, two more um, 
uh, issues. Uh, this is an issue with herring eggs with uh, nano one Biblio cholerae. Uh, this was particularly interesting in that uh, in British Columbia, there's a very intense uh, uh, herring fishery. And this is uh, in our First Nations communities. So when the water um, is changing, um, you start to see these cultural practices come into play. And I think we need to be aware that there are other Vibrios out there with, with our changing climate and changing practices that uh, we need to be looking out for. Uh, uh, 2020 was interesting. Uh, everybody was suffering uh, through COVID, our industry as well. Um, and we had an outbreak in uh, our East Coast. We, we rarely get cases there. But this was uh, difficult as, as, as we were in COVID and it was difficult to investigate. But this is something we are keeping an eye on because we don't know if these are background cases or this is a, a consequence. I mentioned that the BC Center for Disease Control um, sends out weekly report of cases. So I just wanted to show you an example of that where uh, the red is the running average and then the blue is the number of cases. And when those cases are higher than normal, especially the sporadic cases, is some control measures need to come in play. And uh, on that note, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Enrico. Um, I was intrigued that you um, did um, consult with your industry Given that most of your cases that set this in train were on the British Columbian side, how did the Atlantic oyster industry feel about this? Did they feel forced into taking something they didn't want or were they happy to uptake it? I didn't get very much response from the Atlantic side. Um, although I will tell you that in 2015, there were cases from harvest from the Atlantic, but the bulk of it was really in the uh, Pacific side. When we look at those illness data, um, the reason we applied it nationally is there were cases resulting from products from imports as well as the Atlantic. Um, we will see how we'll, we'll progress. Uh, we have gone nationally and gone to regional meetings to talk about our guidelines uh, over the years and we didn't get uh, too many complaints. Some were uh, actually following the U.S. processes. And we don't really object to, to the industry following it. As long as they meet the 100 MPN criteria, you can use whatever process you want. Okay. And, and that remains our position. You can innovate to that level where you can sell to anywhere in the world. And I think that's what we encourage. Okay. 